further ado, Chip, our moderator today's evening. Hey, everybody. We're here tonight to talk about blockchain, and I'd like to ask the panelists to come up. Uh, first, Anna O'Brien, who's general manager of IBM Watson Blockchain IoT. Stacy Schneider, VP of Provide. And Dylan Katz, uh, founder and VP of InfoChain. So why don't each of you guys introduce yourselves, and why don't we start with Dylan? Have a seat. Hi, guys. I'm, I'm Dylan Katz. Um, my journey with blockchain began about three years ago. Um, I was in college at the time, and um, I realized that the biggest future business opportunities would be in emerging tech. Um, so at that time, I started learning about all kinds of different tech. Until finally I discovered uh, Bitcoin and I was completely blown away um, and captivated because not only was um, it just really interesting technology, but it had this ideology about it um, that was inherently disruptive, um, which really appealed to me, um, especially as I'd been looking at uh, AI, which is, um, which is more complementary of existing institutions because of all the data you need to build neural networks and the like. Um, and so that's why blockchain was so interesting to me. Um, and finally, I started talking to my dad about it, who is an old telco head um, and who's been in the telecom space for decades, um, at which point we started looking at how you could apply uh, blockchain technology in that space. And that's where InfoChain was born. Um, and so that's what we do. Currently, our claim to fame is a proof of concept with a leading industry group um, to combat fraud and uh, stolen devices in the space. Thanks, Stacy. Cool. Thank you. Um, my name is Stacy Schneider. I started looking at blockchain, I guess, about four years ago. Um, I had been deep in the belly of how we build software better, faster, more with uh, working in Cloud Foundry and working as a, in heading up of the Java community for Spring. And one of the core committers said that he needed to leave me and he needed to go spend time to go study blockchain because this is how we were going to do democratized data. And I was like, say what? <laughs> so I started paying attention to it, started reading about it, started getting really into seeing where they were, and it was still really early. Um, in uh, the time space for it, and I thought I saw about a year or so ago that it was time to start paying attention for the enterprise. Um, and so I've pivoted and been working in blockchain for about a year and a half now. Um, I am currently with Provide because I found a platform that's building software just like uh, we helped simplify build software at Cloud Foundry, and we're doing the same thing for helping to simplify blockchain development. And it's really exciting to go see all the different use cases and how we are really changing markets, uh, changing applications, and changing our approach to data. Thank you. Good evening, Anna O'Brien, IBM. Um, I have had the privilege of working with blockchain for about three years, so I'm kind of the young one in the group. Um, and came about blockchain uh, because uh, the customers I was working with were very interested in parts provenance. And it just seemed logical that we should take advantage of Hyperledger, which is a part of IBM is a part of the hyperledger.org, uh, which is where it's open source. You can find lots of tools to help you build your blockchains. And we worked to have blockchain integrated with our application. And in doing that, we found several industries that were very interested in that exact parts providence. And then as we talked to them, we found other use cases. Um, but aviation is huge, uh, oil and gas, um, as well as telco, energy, and utilities. So I have the privilege of getting to focus 2019 on telco and energy utilities and look forward to talking to you today about some of the wonderful use cases. So what I found fascinating about blockchain really is the idea of distributed trust because that's what to me seems really innovative about it. But on some levels, I think the reaction is it doesn't make a lot of sense. So why should I trust a distributed 
ledger as opposed to just trusting my ledger at the bank. And I think that's something that people really need to understand. Do you want to take a... Uh... Sure, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's kind of silly to go into a market and be like, you have to find one person to trust. That seems very antiquated. We should be able to trust <clears throat> the entire market. Um, so flip the question uh, and, and, and think of it that way. Um, you know, I, I would like to be able to not just um, borrow money from a bank, but be able to borrow money from a complete stranger and they could make better money on their returns uh, if we had a credit system that was peer-to-peer. -peer. And then you didn't have to be a bank, you didn't have to be licensed because the market made sure that everybody behaved according to the rules of the market. And I think that that is a powerful thing to go change world economies. Right, absolutely. And part of the, the, the trustless society um, and being able to self-identify allows you to eliminate friction within your transactions. Because right now you have to go through a clearinghouse and a bank or you know, who knows how many other third parties you need to go through to conduct one transaction. So through a hyperledger or at, you know, the blockchain, you're able to have all parties participate within that single ledger. So you don't have three different ledgers or five different ledgers. There's just one ledger and everybody has the same truth. Uh, if I may, I'd like to add a quick point um, because you asked about why, why you want that trust to be distributed. Um, and this is something Stacy touched upon about um, in the current paradigm, all of that trust is concentrated very narrowly um, based on one or a few actors. But in a, dis uh, in a distributed trust system, suddenly, especially in the case of public blockchains, that trust is now uh, dispersed so widely and so thinly over thousands of different uh, actors that uh, bad behavior of one or a couple or a dozen has no impact on the system as a whole. Um, and especially in some countries, maybe in other parts of the world where uh, you're living under an oppressive regime, suddenly, instead of having your money in a bank account that um, that actor can just unilaterally take, um, you suddenly have assets living on a uh, decentralized distributed ledger all over the world that is not so easy for the government to seize. And um, if you think about it in terms of money as well, um, it offers an alternative to fiat money, which is basically a monopoly at this point. And again, in some of those countries like Venezuela, if, if you're living in those countries and the fiat money goes on rampant inflation, you're out of luck. But finally, you have alternatives, uh, which gives people the freedom and provides competition. To me, the power of uh, blockchain really seems to be better as an open platform. I think a lot of what I see people offering as apps in the marketplace right now are uh, uh, you know, a single purpose app and they're writing it in, in, in the blockchain and it's not really shared in any way. You're basically using an app and I have a hard time distinguishing between that and using a database. Um, Aren't we really looking for more open platforms and more collaborative apps? Yeah, for sure. I think that's when we're going to hit our stride. Um, can you imagine uh, the world where if your healthcare records were all on the blockchain and into a share pool where you had complete privacy over your personal information, but some of the heuristics and telemetrics of the tests that have been run or whatever could be out there and we can now have open research. That could be powerful. We would actually be able to get prescribed therapies for individual people. People are trying to do that now, <coughs> but that it, it, it's very difficult and it's very expensive. And if we go and start pooling our resources, which is what we learned in open source. Open source, 10 years ago, developers learned that, why would I go build all of this stuff myself when I can just go and get and contribute into a larger organization that is going to go provide my Apache Tomcat server, right? 70% of the world used to run on Apache Tomcat. And people are like, why am I building my own application servers? Why are we building our own data infrastructures? Why are we all building our own markets? This seems very silly in this day and age. What we should be doing is working like the banks are working and they're working together in a consortium for Quorum 
and they're trying to work together and get rid of the SWIFT system, which adds an obscene amount of uh, cost of a middleman on the, in, on the transfer of funds between countries. Um, and so all of those organizations are pooling their resources together to go save themselves and get economies of scale. I think that is where the true power comes, is when we build these open markets that can truly be peer-to-peer, -peer, I think that's where we're going to get the, uh, we're going we're gonna to realize that this was the better way. Right, absolutely. And, and one of the other things is with blockchain, you know, you talked about sharing the health records. Within... Um, the blockchain infrastructure, it is possible to permission information. So if you don't want to share your information sure. for um, research, or if you just want to make sure that the physician you're working with has current access to your health record, then you can also grant that. But that also goes with financial transactions, other business transactions. It's You are able to do permissionable. So even though we're talking about this open data, that um, you do have the power as the data owner to control that access. So it, it, it's up to you how much is open. So with Robert's intellectual property, um, he can have his customers decide what, he's, what is going to be available on the open market or open visibility. So because intellectual property, if I go and see a lyric and I build something off that lyric, should I give credit? You know, and, and being able to see just random um, songs, I need, I, you know, that's not going to protect it. You know, that's not the goal of the application. The goal is to protect those individuals. So you do have to have permissionable. Um, so when you're looking at open source, you do want to make sure that you're taking it that into account because there are still some different open source options. Yeah. It's, it seems to me like we're at really early times because it really hasn't reached the point where there's interoperability and people are building multifunctional apps and app exchanges. Are there any real cool proof of concepts that you guys have seen? that would surprise us, that we wouldn't be expecting, or are in different markets that are unusual? You want to start? Probably my favorite one is the tuna one. Um, we are actually, um, when uh, fishermen are out fishing for tuna, and you can, you know, in the news lately, there's a $300,000 tuna. You know, and if you're the one that caught that tuna, you want to make sure that nobody takes that tuna and you get your 300000 right? So what, the, what we're doing is we're working in a proof of concept where that tuna actually gets tagged. So it's geo-tracked, so I know that the fisherman got it from a sustainable area. Um, I know who the fisherman's, re you know, who the registry for that IoT device is. And then I can track that tuna throughout the supply chain. So as the restaurant who buys that tuna, I know when it was fished. I know how long it stayed on the boat. I know when it hit distribution on land. So I've got all of that information. Now, from a greater food supply chain, imagine if we had access to that kind of information with this romaine lettuce thing that happened in November. I mean, we would be able to track exactly who we needed to shut down rather than every romaine lettuce head that came out of the state of California, which was a huge impact on the state financially. And they really didn't need that after all the forest fires. But that, that's one of the things we're doing. And there's many others, but uh, that's one that I always find interesting is tagging that poor little fish. <laughs> I like tuna fishing too. Yeah. You got me with that one. Um, I think probably the coolest thing that we're working on is we are breaking DNS, which is the process of how a your web browser knows that the Coca-Cola.com is, you know, 76.101.171.2 or whatever the number is. And that machine, that whole process that's done um, to go reconcile web addresses to actual physical servers is done through a central agency, which is a central point of failure for the internet. And we have had failures. So we had the whole eastern seaboard went down about two years ago when we had uh, those MIT students or Harvard students that were... Uh, Going rogue. Yeah, they, 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 they took us all down and they've you know, got the Googles of the world and the Netflixes of the world really angry of having a day with no service. Um, and uh, what we're doing is we're actually decentralizing that so the internet can actually truly be decentralized. And one of the cool things that'll be for you guys will be the prices of websites will go down and the types of websites that you can get. Right now, if you want to go, if I wanted a dot Stacy. I would have to uh, address. I would have to go and pay $200,000 with my application to ICANN 
in order to get that, and that would be something that you would just be able to do. Um, and that is actually in the proof of concept stage. We're on the third one, which I think is rolling out uh, next month, and it will be live uh, probably summertime, right? Yeah. So that's a pretty cool. Uh... Someone from the crowd on the Slido has asked um, about blockchain and scaling. They want to know if it's really effective for authentication in an IoT network with millions of devices. So does it scale? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I talked about the fish, and you're not going to get a you know a million fish a day. Um, but when you're looking at, let's take an aircraft. Um, so one wing of an A380 produces over a gig of data per transatlantic flight. That's one wing. And there's two wings. Okay. So taking that information and applying it to the aircraft's record. So I can keep track of every flight, every flight hour, every incident, every maintenance check, every equipment particle that joins that aircraft. So bringing all of that in, that record just for one aircraft is exponentially large. And as you know, aircraft don't, you know, airlines don't make money when an aircraft's on the ground. So they're, they're going constantly. So being able to keep that information in the, in the cloud, on a blockchain, allows them to access it not only at the hub in Atlanta, but also when they're landing down at Charles de Gaulle, or they need to go to an off-site maintenance facility, or if they're going to London or Amsterdam, wherever the aircraft goes, that record is always following them. And it's more concise than what the FAA requires them to carry from a maintenance log, because it has parts providence, it has the IoT information. It's far more fulsome record uh, that allows them to bring that data. So it's, it's scaling on a very large um, platform. And then I know that you've experienced even more in, in one of your use cases, I think we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think blockchain gets a, gets a bad rap for the fact that Bitcoin, which is the most famous application of blockchain to date, um, Bitcoin is famous for being able to handle seven transactions per minute uh, or per second. Uh, one of the two. It doesn't matter. It's terrible. Um, and, uh, we've actually gone and built uh, the way that we built our consensus and we built you know built our platform is we can actually make Bitcoin the Bitcoin network. So there's the capital B and then the small B. It's the Bitcoin network. We can go and get it to a million transactions per second, and we haven't stressed our system fully yet. So there's definitely ways around it. I will say though, in you know, I just I'm in the middle of uh, a market study, um, an enterprise blockchain study uh, that I'm doing with Emory and Aprio, and uh, we asked people what they really wanted out of the blockchain and scaling. There's there's trade-offs in every kind of system, and it's you know it's going to be the block time, it's going to be the scalability and the security. And 60% of the people said the number one thing was security. So you're really looking to make sure that you've got that immutable ledger, you've got, you know exactly what's happening on there, and that your data is cryptographically secure. The 61% said the least thing, the, the part that was the least important was the scalability. Because decentralized, which is the heart of the blockchain, it's a decentralized network, it does have scale. You've just got to get to the consensus algorithms or whatnot. They, fit. they make sense together. That dovetails into another question from the Slido, um, where someone's asked, how do you secure a blockchain from being penetrated? And that reminds me of the article I saw last week that generated a huge number of clicks on quantum computing, listing <laughs> it as a threat to the blockchain. Is it really a threat? Are all these things really a threat? Or, or uh, for somebody who's practically building a business today? Um, so I think quantum computers do represent a threat, but given the fact that we're really not going to see usable uh, quantum computers for at least a decade. Um, there, first of all, is plenty of time to change the way that uh, blockchains are being built. Um, and when we start to see that we're getting closer and closer to these uh, quantum computers being ready, um, probably before then even, they're going to start making some changes to how, uh, I guess, the infrastructure of these uh, distributed systems work. Um, I think also that this kind of idea of a new technology um, having coming in and uh, creating a threat for 
new or even existing paradigms is something that you always see, and there always seems to be a way to get around these security threats. Um, I'm sure there are similar things being said about the internet back in the day. Um, and then one thing to also keep in mind is that um, there are a couple of different attack vectors in which quantum computers can um, harm uh, blockchains, one of which is proof of work. For those of you who aren't familiar, proof of work is the way that um, most mainstream blockchains, public blockchains, like Bitcoin, use to determine uh, which miner or validator um, appends the most recent block to the chain. Um, and it's tied into forming um, consensus uh, between all the nodes. Um, and so there is a threat of a quantum computer being able to come in and uh, achieve 51% of that hash power, which would give them basically uh, the sole uh, right to add to the blockchain. But many permission blockchains use different consensus mechanisms not built on proof of work. So that attack vector would not be uh, relevant to them. And many public blockchains are even moving to what's called proof of stake, um, which is a completely different model based on people who want to add to the chain and validate transactions, putting, um, let's take Ethereum, putting their Ether at stake. Um, and if the rest of the chain determines that they were trying to cheat or defraud the chain, everything they stake uh, is taken away from them automatically, um, kind of disincentivizing them um, from acting maliciously because it will only harm themselves. Um, so that's, again, another attack vector in which a quantum computer uh, will not have as much of an impact. And even some of the other blockchains are building them uh, to be inherently quantum resistant. So another question from the Slido. How does a company get started building blockchain strategy? Um, where are their places so they're not starting from scratch? Um, go. Thank you. We have, hyper, well, there's Hyperledger and there's a bunch of tools available to Hyperledger. So, just like we have Squarespace now, so they help you go out and build a web page, <clears throat> it still takes, you know, there's some still some technology knowledge uh, necessary, but the tools are there to help you build the components that you need, identity, your fabric, um, the quorum, that all is part of the tool set available to the Hyperledger. Um, and Hyperledger actually isn't an IBM product. We are part of the organization that created Hyperledger. So we, we've built our blockchain on Hyperledger. So uh, you can go in and you can create using those tools. So it, it's not like you have to go and find somebody who's just studied in blockchain. Um, there's a capability of retooling some of the developers you already have uh, into blockchain developers without a lot of effort. And I think you found the same. Yeah, and I, I would also add that the Hyperledger project actually has a great set of free courses or very, very cheap courses that you can take. Hyperledger is one of 17 different flavors of uh, protocols that you can go after. Um, it is maybe not the right one for you, but certainly they've done a really good job with their training materials where the other projects probably haven't, and so you'll get a lot of priming there. I think, though, that right now, you guys are doing one of the best things ever is come out, come to these kinds of events, go to hackathons if you're a developer, or go to additional events where you can actually go and meet and greet and, and talk to people and kind of really see it in traction. Um, I would also say that if you are at the point of ready to build a POC, um, I, the provide platform is platform agnostic, so you could use Hyperledger, you could use Bitcoin, Ethereum, like Quorum. Actually, we don't have full support for Hyperledger yet, but we could, we could arrange it for you. Um, so uh, we make it really easy because the, the process of setting it up is just complicated because you're doing lots and lots of different nodes and you've got to know a lot of ABI in order to just even get your head around how to set those things up. And if you do know what it is, it can take you about six days to set up a, a, a substantial network. And uh, we can reduce that to you for six minutes. So that gets you more focused on the code, which is all into the benefits of building platforms. Uh, but I would start with that, and then if you're ready to build a POC, Absolutely. Uh, we can help you get that done faster. Someone says that in their opinion, uh, blockchain is 80% business and 20% technical. Um, do you see that the successes are being driven from the business side of the enterprises or the technical side? 
the business side, definitely, because when we're going in to talk to customers, especially when we're talking to IT, they're all very curious about blockchain. But when it comes to actually starting a POC or, or talking to the business, it's about revenue for telcos. Where is my revenue? Or where is my cost savings or efficiency? So it does come down to what is my business benefit? So it's, you know, that's the key point of all our proof of concepts. I think it's, that's the goal. I think yeah. the software industry in a while, for a long time has been working to go make it simpler to do the technology so we can all focus on the business and adding extra value. So if you're doing that upside down, then I think you've got a problem where the industry's got a hole in it. Um, I think actually um, in the very early days, or particularly talking about public blockchains, um, most of the success so far has been a, uh, through building infrastructure. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, basically these platforms for others to build on. Um, but moving into the future, um, the projects being built on top of these platforms are gonna be like any other startup. If you're not solving a business problem, you can't find product market fit, um, you're not gonna make any money and eventually that well is gonna run dry. The dot-com days are over. <laughs> Dot Stacy is they're coming. There, there you go. <laughs> Someone else asked a really interesting question about trust, saying basically if trust is distributed, who is accountable for theft or other problems that could arise in a blockchain system? It's generally built into the system. So, you know, however that, however, whatever the consequences of the action, the system has to go and satisfy all the conditions in order for something to happen, and it's transparent what, something didn't happen and the transaction just doesn't occur. Yeah. That's it's pretty simple. Yeah, because they, they, you know, we were talking about quantum computer and the reason that the people are concerned about the quantum is the ability to break that prime. You know, I can find the prime if I can use a quantum computer to find the prime. So basically in order to be a bad actor outside of the chain, you really have to uh, work at it, to hack it. I'm sure that it's you know, somebody somewhere is going to find a way to do it just because they can. Um, but, you know, that's one of the things that, that, that's the reason that quantum scares people is because its ability to process information in order to potentially locate that prime number that gives you access into that blockchain to do bad things. So from a transaction perspective, you're higher risk doing banking online than you are doing banking through a blockchain. What non-money related applications are blockchain people making money with? Ooh. And is anyone making money with blockchain now? The, the top industries right now are in payments. So uh, Bitcoin or BitPay, uh, which is, I think, we used to be in this building and now I think they're across the street. Uh, payments is a, the primary thing. We, we started off with the financial market and then of course the infrastructure market, building the infrastructure and tooling, that's a natural uh, place where money is being made to simplify the development for everybody else. Uh, gaming is pretty big. Um, gamers are, that's the third largest. And then you're starting to see more things around IoT and supply chain. You're starting to see some more things around healthcare. Um, there are some um, other, I'm trying to think of what other, some other ones are. Uh, identity. Identity, yeah, yeah. Identity. identity. Well, that's more governments. I don't know if the governments are making money off of it, but they're doing, they're actually like changing fundamentally how we do identity management. Yeah. We're actually doing that in the states. I don't know if you guys know that, but the state of Illinois <laughs> is moving people over to the blockchain. They also move their real estate market over there. Real estate's a cool one, too, because you can go and eliminate. If you know what the house is, you don't have to do a title search anymore, which is like immediately a $400 savings. But then there's lots of other little things that can go really drive down your costs for purchasing a home right. or any kind of large asset. And for non-revenue generating, although it, it has an impact on revenue, is along the regulatory aspect. Again, food safety, mm -hmm. um, uh, transaction, um, NTSB, um, being able to get your information related to train, airplanes, those types of things, being able to hold those records um, for the regulatory standpoint. They're using it to validate the origin of diamonds. 
So it's, it's from a regulatory standpoint, but it has an impact to the financials. So I don't think that there's really any way you can get away from how does it help you make money. Yeah, that's actually your, your point on the food safety thing with, you know, Walmart has gone and, and rolled out now that they are going to demand um, all their trucks are going to be monitored with sensors and they're going to, be, apparently, there's some like really ridiculous number, like 70% of their deliveries are late by a day or more, which sounds crazy because they're delivering food. Uh, but that is, that's truth. That's a truth for uh, Walmart. And so now they're going to be monitoring that the food didn't go underneath the temperature um, so that they can make sure that they know exactly which romaine lettuce was bad, which one got into a bad situation and overheated and became un unsafe. Um, another big thing, which I think is probably going to be the reason why every enterprise is going to go in there, is compliance. Um, basically, the blockchain is your easy button to get rid of compliance hassles and to uh, automatically be compliant. So uh, GDPR and then I can never remember CC. California one. CCPA. <laughs> I always forget the last letter. The California one uh, that's going to come in next year. This is going to take uh, U.S. businesses by storm. Uh, Europe has already been struggling with it, and this is, the fines are hefty. The fines are very hefty. Uh, I think in Europe it was something like a million dollars per incident. For, <clears throat> yes, yeah. it is that bad. And for international companies like IBM, it can be a little crippling. But yes, um, yeah. being able to reach out to people is going to be very interesting going forward. Yeah, risk avoidance is going to be a big deal um, to save yourself. So, so how exactly does it help with compliance in that kind of situation? Can you walk us through the use case? Sure, so you would actually like build, so there, there's two ways. One, like you could just like kind of like, you know, the, the, right now we see GDPR where you've got everybody's website, you go in there, you say, oh, I got to click that button and yes, I know that you use cookies. I've been transparently told um, that you've used cookies, right? And so they accept that and they got to track that they, they say that and they also need to be able to say that they can get rid of your information if so asked and they need yeah. to be able to prove that they actually do d delete your information. Yeah. Well, what if they never had it? What if you were in charge of having that information and you said, yes, I give you permission? Sort of think of this as Facebook, right, where you've got all those different apps. And Facebook's not a great example because they've had a lot of problems with their privacy, but think if it actually worked. And <laughs> yeah, I know. Bear with me for a second. But yeah, dream. Let's dream, dream together, yeah. folks. Um, if only. Yeah, so think of it actually worked and it said, okay, well, I'm going to go let, uh, I'm going to go let Spotify have my information. And, uh, but Spotify is sending me too many emails or whatever. I can go change all of that through like kind of a, you know, a Facebook profile. And I can say, well, I don't want them to have that. Or if I want to go delete that, I hit the delete button. And it's me. I'm in charge of my data. And guess what? I can take my same data and I can go give it to Pandora if I want to, or what other app, I can go shopping and I can still have my profile, I can still have all that information, but you become in charge of it. This is what legislation is telling us and we are all refusing to believe it. Yeah, and actually the example you give, you're actually giving them access to your blockchain, so they never actually have the data. Right. You know, you're going to let them view, again, permissionable. They have access to that data, so you can turn them off. And they've never stored it or, or the way that you set it up. They don't store it to begin with. So you they just shut them down. Yeah. And I think also you can use smart contracts um, in such a way to help with compliance because let's say maybe you have some kind of service uh, level agreement and you have to Absolutely. design it in such a in such a way that uh, it's compliant with whatever rules and regulations, well, you can code that into the smart contract so that um, it only operates within the confines of what's allowed um, because it's running on every node uh, in the network. And just also the fact that blockchains are inherently transparent makes them inherently auditable as well. So it makes that tremendously easier. I think people are still asking questions about do regulations need to be created to uh, enable the use of blockchain for these contracts? And I think that the answer is no. It's they're more like the business rules that the applications <clears throat> will follow. Well, in some cases, um, bad things are what is what it takes for our governments 
to take on new technology. There has to be a failure in the current way they're doing things with their multiple sources of the truth before they will accept the fact that maybe there needs to be another way. And the food issue in California is one of those because they had to go to all these different places to get the information, whereas if it was all out on a blockchain, then the ag department would be, the USDA and the, you know, the US ag department would be able to go and access that information so they could backtrace the source of the, of the issue rather than shutting down the whole state. But again, we have to, as a, as a country, or as a citizens group, have to force that issue because they're happy with the way things are going. Of course, right now, none of them are getting paid to do anything, but, you know, they, there has to be, unfortunately, a tragedy before we'll get the new technology out there. But I do think, though, to some degree that, you know, <clears throat> we have the legislation. It's just how we interpret it and how we go uh, try to satisfy the right. legislation. I mean, we've had lots and lots of, um, like every time I turn this way, I talk louder. Um, we've had lots of uh, press about, you know, sham organizations that were, you know, doing an ICO and they were raising all this money and now the SEC is coming down on them and ICOs are sort of dried out. But you know what? The SEC didn't make any new legislation. We've had the same legislation since the 30s. And that's because it already works and they have already been, you know, figuring out how we go and interpret against what we already have. Yeah. We are seeing new legislation around privacy, I think, because we're getting into this age of... Uh, where Access. people are becoming more in control. Um, we are asking for us to be you know, more at the center of the universe versus like organizations or governments. Um, we have seen the growth of the industry start with like the internet and then we went into the social, um, at, which is like the Web 3.0 stuff. And now we're kind of hitting to the point where we want transparency and trust. And this is a natural evolution that we're moving more towards we become more in charge of it. Yeah. And that's just changing how we're interpreting the laws and legislations that's already in action, that we're already doing and evolving naturally as in a society. Right, and that's where your Walmart use case can actually, because you know, with Walmart making these demands on their food safety, that will impact the market because Walmart has that kind of a buying power. You know, they're the reason we have UPC codes because they insisted <coughs> that all of the products they bought had a UPC code. And so now they're on all the products. So as they're pushing, so you have leaders, um, oh. as they're pushing for this technology to be taken advantage of, they are going to help us catalyst the rest of the environment. What's the public's perception of blockchain after Bitcoin's dark web usage? I think it's really important to sort of separate blockchain from Bitcoin. We got Please. everything from like... <laughs> dark web and porn, didn't we? I mean, like, all, all, all kinds of stuff came from there. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. You know, unfortunately, for better or for worse, technology advancements have come out of our own vices. So, you know, we were talking about high-speed streaming video. It's because we have an appetite for porn. And so, in order to get high-speed streaming video, that was the first group that figured out how to do that. So, unfortunately, Bitcoin is the primary currency for the dark web. So now, it, you know, the only thing you hear in mainstream media is about Bitcoin and the bad things it lets you do. And even in the television shows, you'll see some of the crime shows talking about all these bad things and they did through Bitcoin. But unfortunately, unless you're really diving into the topic, you're not seeing the good part of what's available. And Bitcoin's just an app on the Bitcoin operating system, so to speak. Um, so, you know, there's so much more available than Bitcoin or Ether and or whatever. Let's be honest, there's a lot more damage done with the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Like, I mean, the amount that's done with Bitcoin is really, really paltry compared to what everything else. It's gotten a bad rep, I think, because Silk Road uh, back in the day. But uh, right now, it's doing so much I mean, more positive things. There's 1.8 billion people in the world that are unbanked. That means they cannot get a bank account, even if they want to or they have money, they cannot. They're nowhere near any place. But they do have phones, and they can actually, you know, earn money. Um, and now we have the ability where people, we can build a world economy where we can go transfer money across borders. 
I, you know, I spend a healthy amount of my time living in a third world nation, and there are lots of people there that uh, are there working um, to go send money to Haiti, Dominican Republic, Philippines, et cetera, because they can earn a wage there where they can't earn a wage back for their families. And then Western Union takes out like 20% of their earnings to go send it back. And so they're working on a, on a cripple economy and they're, they're penalized because they are not able to have a bank. And that's uh, a huge, for telco, that's a huge um, market for them, both the globe in the Philippines and Airtel in India, because of this unbanked. You know, they're the ones buying up all these flip phones that we're, you know, selling on the internet. You know, they're buying those up because they still have 2G. They're also buying Telco's old 2G stuff. So they're setting up 2G networks just so that they can do banking. Well, what if they actually could do um, blockchain currency and cut out the bank and the fees and all of that, and they get more of their money, what little it is, to do more and you know, hopefully maybe get themselves out of the situation. And then when you were talking about you know, being able to do one-on-one -on -one loans, what if you could give a micro loan you know, to someone, to a women's group in Nepal making baskets? And you know, you're, you're going global with your economy and it, it just opens that up because I know you're who you say you are because we have this trusted environment. Or I don't even need to know who you are right. because the system's just gonna ensure it's gonna work. Yeah. It's kind of amazing what we can do. Um, I think Stacy and Anna brought up a number of uh, really compelling use cases with the technology. And to bring this back towards back around to uh, the topic of Bitcoin or uh, blockchain's reputation, um, all it takes is for one of those use cases to kind of catch fire as the killer app, the same way that the email was for the internet. Um, and at that point, uh, blockchains will be associated with uh, more beneficial things to society. So we were talking about Bitcoin. In terms of blockchain, what are the real costs? Is it as expensive to use as Bitcoin? Because we hear about all the environmental resources people use mining and recording the transactions. You know, if I build a real business around blockchain, will I have significantly higher costs? than just a regular SaaS business? Uh, I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, but there's a distinction between proof of work, which, uh, as I explained, is the way to secure the Bitcoin blockchain, um, and the block and the blockchain itself, which is just a data structure. So um, all of the energy usage and um, the, ener the electricity of a small country being used to power these things is for the proof of work, not for the blockchain itself. And so there are ways to build blockchain-based systems that are much more uh, eco-friendly. Yeah. I think that, you know, in all cases, they, you know, we're starting to see the tooling and the infrastructure is maturing. Um, you, you know, it, it really depends. It depends on what you're doing. Um, if you want to go run your own private network, you might increase your compute power because you're doing lots of nodes around the world. Um, so you might have a little bit more compute, uh, but that said, um, you know, you uh, can use some of the public systems. Like, you know, if you're going and going using consortium, uh, like say Quorum, which is the f uh, finance industry's one, you know, you're not paying for it. The consortium is. So you're going to get a lot of resources for free once we start really pooling the resources uh, together. Yeah. Um, so it depends on how your markets are working, what your application is. Um, certainly when you're working with the newer, edgier technologies, some of the skills and resources are, you know, to have somebody that's got two years of experience developing Solidity smart contracts is harder to find right now and they're at a premium. That said, uh, I did, we did a hackathon in October and uh, people came in of all different stripes that were uh, had never built before, and they all built applications, like applications that did things that we didn't tell them to do. They invented themselves. They built that in 36 hours, and they showcased it off. So it's not really that hard if you know software programming to become a developer. Um, it's just about a matter of building experience and confidence. Yeah. And, you know, it's all about economy of scale. You know, you're, you know, it's the bleeding edge of technology, and it may be a little bit more expensive to do some of the special stuff, 
but you know, just like you know, cell phones back in the day, they were expensive. Now, relatively speaking, everybody has one, and they're relatively cheap. So, um, well, the service, not the phone. Um, so, uh, it, it, we're you know, as we get more and more people adopting the blockchain and building applications on it, the cost of the infrastructure will go down. Several people have asked questions about voting. Do you know? if it's being used in any voting systems or to secure any voting systems, and what are the advantages of that? Well, I live in North Carolina, and I wish that's how we did it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that there is actually somebody here in ATV that is doing uh, something for campaign contributions um, in order to put transparency into campaigns, but I don't believe it's actually into voting quite yet, although some of the infrastructure for countries um, is definitely starting to be laid where you become a, you, you become, a, you've got to, be you become tokenized. Um, so your identity is uh, on the blockchain, and so that would be able to, you know, correlate your voting. And that would be the first thing. It's like, we need to know who yeah, you yeah, are before we know first. who you're voting for. Yeah. I, I may be mistaken, but I think I read something about some kind of local government in West Virginia starting to experiment with uh, blockchain-based voting. And um, I think once you can nail the kind of challenges around privacy on blockchain-based systems, um, voting offers um, the benefit of immutability. Because um, I know in the last presidential election, there was some hysteria about uh, whether Russians were getting into voting machines and stuff like that. Um, but if you have an immutable record of that, uh, that threat is mitigated. Oh, so polling. Is it polling? Yeah, but I don't think it's actually in voting. Yeah. At least I haven't seen it. Yeah. I bet Saudi Arabia is like really far ahead on that actually. Yeah, he was saying that he found on Google Thailand, Thailand, yeah, Thailand's actually using the blockchain or looking to use blockchain for voting. And, and as far as I'm concerned, I think that would be great. Not only it would take away the question of fraud, but I would be able to identify myself at my home and vote right there. I don't have to worry about do I need to get off work, do I need to do this. So the whole I'm not, I don't have access is limited where you do have issues is those people who don't have computers or access, but again, <clears throat> you still have polling places they can go and prove who they are and vote. And it, again, it's immutable and unha or relatively unhackable. I'm sure someone, one of these days someone's going to figure it out. <laughs> Somebody's asking about what organizations are making real investments in blockchain. What organizations are not? Yeah. I, ha I did do uh, the part of this enterprise blockchain study that we're in the middle of uh, right now. I did some analysis uh, earlier this week, and I was actually really, really surprised to see that um, small businesses, businesses that have less than 99 people, uh, are investing uh, 19 times more on average than uh, businesses with over a thousand employees. So I think you're seeing a lot more blockchain investment in these small startups that are trying to uber the uh, established masses in the enterprise. Yeah, and even though IBM is making huge investments, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to get out to those small companies um, and, and encourage them because it is going to be, we, need, we were talking, we need the, net, the, the Facebook of blockchain. So we need somebody to disrupt the usage of blockchain in such a way that all of us want to use it. So it's, it's who's going to come up with that idea. So not, not Facebook, but the idea that's new and innovative and disruptive on blockchain. And who has that idea? Who's going to make it happen? Somebody asked a really interesting question that sort of alludes back to what we were previously talking about, saying, how is blockchain going to affect businesses that rely on aggregated user data? And I think it's going to complicate their uh, business model quite a lot. You guys have any thoughts on that? I'm not sure I follow that question. They were like, they... Well, if, I, if I can control my data so uh -huh. I can opt in and opt out at will, will then basically... Uh, how does all that get to an aggregator, and how does it get um, Well, That's just it. We're going to change that. That's where this whole GDP and CC, whatever, PA, 
um, <coughs> is got it. We're starting to have the control um, of our data. And it, it, you know, it depends on how we're going to continue to use our data. If we're going to go swipe our grocery card, then we're giving away information. Um, and how they use it is up to that organization. But if I start controlling my data and the information that I release, then those people that depend on aggregation, marketing um, is the main industry, then they're going to have to figure out new ways of doing things. I mean, I think it's Talk about an upset. Centralized. <laughs> like, you know, I go back to my healthcare example uh, where we could have a data ocean of healthcare data that all kinds of people could use. Uh, how, how many people in here are organ donors on your, on your, so why would, like, all of you guys are willing to donate your organs, wouldn't you be willing to donate some of your medical history? Yeah. They might not be able to find you, like your personal data where you live, your name, that part wouldn't be able to be found, but anything else that you've done medically, would you not contribute that to science if you're ready to give your heart or your kidney? I mean, I think if we start going in and building into these economies of scale, this is where you're going to start seeing some amazing benefits that's going to actually help you live healthier lives. And I think that, you know, it's all about what the ag what's being aggregated. So you, if you're doing that centrally, you're going to get everybody. You're not going to get just the little corner and the piece of the pie that you can do anyway. So, and you're going to get it cheaper. And on the topic of controlling your own data, um, there's also been a bit of experimentation with creating data marketplaces in which uh, the owners of the data themselves are being rewarded uh, by the companies paying to access that data rather than a middleman like Facebook doing so. Um, and in case whoever asked that question um, is a data aggregator, um, I would actually consider looking into setting up um, some kind of data marketplace like that to allow um, to, to try and stay relevant and allow people to uh, profit off their own data um, given the threat to your business model. And I'd actually sign up to sell my data. Yeah, there's a, there, what's the name of the browser? That, Brave, the basic attention token. Brave, there's a new browser that's a, called Brave, the basic attention token. And this browser, basically you can go use it in the same way that Facebook or Google collected all of your information you get rewarded for looking at ads. You actually earn money that you can spend uh, through that whole process, and that's the whole goal of this whole thing. Obviously, it's very small at the moment because probably nobody except for Misha knew <laughs> about it in here. Uh, but you know, the ideas and the powerfulness of, of being able to reward individual actors for suffering through advertisement or engaging with businesses um, actually becomes a very positive. We can go use the carrot instead of the sneaky stick. Somebody's asking a follow-up question on fees about uh, uh, how can we truly cut out fees. I think they're trying to follow up on the SWIFT question and the credit card question. Does anybody want to give examples of exactly how much we pay for credit cards? You've had an example and, and personally. And SWIFT transaction yeah. fees. Yeah, uh, so, well, I had a different personal example. I, I had a, a cashier's check in December that I tried to go deposit on December 20th, and Bank of America, it was $13,000, which apparently is right over the money laundering limit of $10,000. And uh, obviously, I'm a shady character working in blockchain, so uh, they just shut me down, and they wouldn't give me my money until January 1st. And I'm like, that's cash. That's what that thing is supposed to be. It's a cashier's check. So how can you hold my money for 10 days? Uh, that's kind of crazy. But the SWIFT system, and like a lot of it, like what BitPay is working on doing right now is uh, if you have a credit card, most of the merchants that you go and swipe your credit card, the reason why they like give you discounts if you do cash is because they pay between 3 and 5%. Uh, and they have to pay every single transaction. That's what the credit card company takes before they get their cash. On top of that, it's about a three-day settlement minimum. So they've got that money for three days and, the, and the, they cannot use it for three days. So you've got a lot of, 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 of costs on just regular transactions. Now when you up it to be international, that's where you get up into between the six and the 10% in order to go clear your money across nation states. Um, so that becomes a, I mean, if you've got a million dollar transaction, do you wanna pay 10% cost on that just to get it to move to Belgium? Seems kind of silly, 
right? So we're working to go zero down those costs and actually make that, uh, you know, so you can, right now people are, are doing it more like maybe it could be a flat fee, that would be ideal, but if you're gonna go use somebody that's gonna go process it over to fiat, you're definitely gonna be uh, paying some money and we're trying to get that more under the 1%, which is 2% and the immediate availability is a massive difference. Mm -hmm. And if everybody can do that and reliably say that they can get that value out of that transaction, which currently that's the only thing that's holding it up, um, is the fact that you've got to go trade it from Bitcoin to, like say if you paid somebody in your Bitcoin, you paid them into their Bitcoin, they want to go get into fiat, it can change rapidly, right? So we need to go narrow that window, which is something we're working on. Someone's asking if we trust China or Russia as a blockchain host. <laughs> Um, I think that's the kind of the whole point is that we move it into a trustless system so they can't yeah. act stupid. Yeah. And that's why we stay on top of the whole quantum computing aspect and the cryptography that will uh, eliminate the threat of quantum computing. We're seeing huge demand for people with experience with blockchain skills. People say they're projected to triple in the next year. Are any real transformational apps being developed behind this? I mean, should we be jumping to learn these skills right now? I mean, for developers, I think you should probably get an idea about Solidity. That's a new programming language for uh, smart contracts for the majority of it. But that's a, that's a language upgrade. That's like speaking a dialect for a developer. I don't think it's really all that difficult. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Um, I think this technology represents a paradigm shift, much like the internet did. So I don't think it's just a flash in the pan. I think this is technology that's here to stay, for sure. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that in these very early days, what's being worked on is very cutting edge and very complex compared to what we're used to in the typical um, traditional client-server model, or even businesses um, just quickly spinning something up on WordPress or Squarespace or uh, whatever, whatever tool you're using. Um, because right now, um, there aren't any mainstream applications to make it considerably easy to spin up blockchain-based solutions. We're, we're starting to get there, but it's not yet mainstream. So the solutions being built now largely require investments in uh, learning about cryptography, uh, game theory, crypto economics, um, and so these are things that can't be built in days or uh, weeks or months, especially since we're in an infrastructure stage right now. Um, but I do think in the coming, the coming years, we're gonna see a lot of really interesting uh, applications built on the technology. Uh, it's just gonna take a little bit more time than we think. Does anybody wanna talk about provenance and how that's used in Blockchain. I'll take that. No. Um, that's where a predominant, uh, I guess, the, the largest quantity of our uh, proof of concepts have been in the Providence. So let's let's take pharma. Uh, we've talked about aviation. We talked about, so let's take pharma. So I have chemicals that all come together to create uh, one pill. And if I can validate the source of each of my, as a valid source, a trusted source, so I know where all of my chemicals come from, when I go to manufacture that medication, I can go back to wherever a medication comes, or wherever the chemical comes from, if I find out later that there's an issue. So, you know, there have been issues with stuff we get from China, occasionally not being uh, what it was what we thought it was going to be. So the production line for anything that came out of that lot of chemicals needed to be recalled. And so being able to understand the distribution for each of those, for that lot of chemicals is key, again, to being able to focus rather than just, you know, cut off the arm. You know, I want to surgically remove the right stuff from the market and reduce the risk that I have financially but at the same time, reduce the risk of somebody getting the bad stuff. So, you know, the, the 
the sourcing of our stuff is very globalized. It's not all coming from 100 miles, although you know, we go to restaurants now that have the 100 mile you know, for where I'm getting my food. But when it comes to the products that we're using every day, the, the base chemicals or the base elements that are in those products have come from all over the globe. And we need to be able to, for our own health and safety, and for those in other countries, be able to understand where all of that comes from. And being able to track that through blockchain, again, makes it easier. You're not going through clearing houses. You're not worried about three different people's ledgers. It's one ledger. Everybody's sharing it. And everybody has access to it. So you understand where everything comes from. I've also seen some uh, manufacturing examples, too, where uh, they're, they're, they want to know that every step was done and that things were destroyed or uh, you know, sensitive information about an, uh, the identification of something couldn't be um, later used so that they could be hacked. Um, that, was, that was like the, the idea of it. And so they used IPFS, which is something I see probably as a competitor to you, but IPFS in an interplanetary file system. It's a pretty cool project. It's pretty easy to use. Uh, uh, and they use that in order to trace the provenance through the manufacturing process to make sure um, specific things were destroyed in the process uh, so that they couldn't be identified or hacked later. Why don't we have one last question, because there have been several people that asked this. Where are we on the hype curve with blockchain? How old are we in internet years? Where do you think it is right now, and when will it really hit mainstream? Um, I'm not so sure about the hype curve, but if I had to compare it to the internet, I would say um, the internet at some point in the 90s, um, we're starting to see some very simple things get picked up, um, some proof of concepts. Uh, businesses are starting to dip their toes in it and experiment, um, but I think we're still waiting for that one killer application, and I still think we have a little bit more work to do on the infrastructure level, uh, particularly when it comes to public blockchains. Um, because there are challenges around scalability, ease of use, uh, privacy, to name a few. Um, but I do think we're, we're on the cusp of uh, things becoming very interesting. We're actually technically in, I think, like November or December of 1996 for adoption. <laughs> I actually do know that, um, and it, uh, but I think that we're doing it a lot faster. So the same study that I've referenced to says like 75% of the people think by 2025 this is going to be mainstream in every enterprise because we're getting there. We're, we've done these tech turns a number of times. We've learned our lessons. We're better at computers in general. We've got a lot more people looking at it. We've got a lot more universities that are studying it and getting in really deep. Um, so I think that we're actually accelerating through this tech change a lot faster than we did before. I think from an investment hype bubble, like thinking like dot com, like we're probably right there in 2001 for the number of people using it. We're in 96, but uh, we're, we're going to catch up, I think, a lot faster than we did. Absolutely. And for those who weren't born yet in 96, that was when we would do email and we would search for things, but we wouldn't give it our credit card. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of where we are, and, and it is going fast. And the sooner we get that game changing, uh, commercially visible uh, application, um, I think that will just make it explode. And the good news is that we have had these big consortiums at work, and we have had a lot of people, a lot, a lot of businesses have been in, in the business for a couple of years now, and it is a lot faster for us to. We can fail a lot faster, we can learn a lot faster, we can evolve and pivot. Um, so I think that probably by the end of this year, we're going to start seeing, seeing things that are impacting. I mean, certainly right now, like I'm, I'm working with people that are panicking because they've got to go figure out how they're going to be compliant with Walmart's, uh, you know, Walmart's like regulations on how you're going to go ship refrigerated food. And that's rolling out by September. So this year, it is like people are going to have to get on the board even if they like it or not. Thanks, everybody, for a great panel discussion. Thank you again to our fabulous panel. And to Chip. Thank and you for moderating. Chip. 
I did want to say thank you all for the feedback. Thank you all, and see you in February.